Welcome to the Inspired with Nika Lori podcast. Lauren, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here today. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Nika. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah. So, so we are going to have a super interesting conversation today. I, I reached out to you because I heard you on a different podcast and I loved what you were talking about. And I was so excited to have you come on my show and kind of talk about it. So obviously we'll get into that. But before we do that, tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do and who you are and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, thank you. Um, So my name is Lauren. Uh, As Nika has let you know, I am a feminist business mentor and a courage coach. And I work with other business owners who are wanting to use their business um, and and really their offerings in the world to create change in their communities and to really disrupt the way that we do things because I don't know if anyone has noticed, but sometimes it can feel like we are living in a dumpster fire and my work and my client's (laughs) work is really focused on, yeah, getting us out of that sort of just like highly traumatic, highly problematic, highly oppressive culture and really moving towards a world where, yeah, all of us have access to safety and joy and pleasure and freedom. Uh, And yeah, when I think people always ask like, how did you get here? And I think back to um, like, I think it was in 2014, my husband and I were traveling um, in India and Mm -hmm. we were at this like little beach hut, like, like hotel essential, or I mean, I don't, I wouldn't call it a hotel, but we were yeah. staying in these beach huts and, <laughs> um, in Arambol in Goa. And we were there for like three weeks. And I remember just like realizing in that moment that I could never have the level of freedom, the level of pleasure, the level of agency, um, if I didn't have my own business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so pretty much in 2014, I decided that like I was going to become a business owner. And um, very quickly, I learned that the way we do things, especially in the online space, um, can feel really not good. For me, as like the business owner, as the marketer, it can feel not good. And as a consumer also, um, there's just a lot of shame, a lot of blame, a lot of guilt in online marketing. And so I really wanted to find a way to do that differently. And so I started my coaching practice uh, working with women who wanted to bring their businesses and their lives into alignment with their own cycles and also with the moon. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in 2019, I switched to focus specifically around business and weaving in a feminist lens, but also really focusing on yeah, how we can do this work without burning ourselves out, without... um, yeah, giving up on our own desires, on our own pleasure, and like really finding this way to put a balance between the purpose, but our reason for being here, and the things that bring us pleasure and joy. And it's just like, I feel so grateful that this is the work that I get to do. And I'm really excited to yeah be talking to your audience about how business and yeah, how we can be more responsible both as business owners, but also as consumers. Um, in this world that really needs a lot of love and a lot of help right now. Absolutely. I think, you know, I, I I love one of the reasons why I I think I connected to you in when I heard you on a different episode was your, your interest in kind of being more conscious consumers and really thinking about, you know, really putting some effort into thinking about this decisions we're making really in all aspects of our life, not just in the products we buy, but how we interact with people, the words we use when we interact with people, how we approach different situations. And, um, you know, I, I agree with you. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of hurt and pain in the world right now, but I think Mm. I want to be an optimist because I think there's a lot that we can do to change, to improve it, but Mm. we all have to kind of step up and decide this is what we're going to do to help make the world a little bit of a better place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. We, I mean, I am also like a total cheesy romantic and like 
endless optimist. Um, <laughs> so I feel you on that. I love it. Love it. So you refer to yourself as a, as a feminist business mentor. Can you explain like what is feminist business and, and how do you mentor that really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I just want to name that there are like lots of flavors of feminism mm -hmm. and even someone who refers to themselves on a daily basis as a feminist business mentor, I question, um, the connotations and like everything that is tied up with this idea of feminism, but yeah. currently it's like the best descriptor I have. So I'm using it. Uh, but my flavor of feminism is really rooted in a social perspective and a political perspective that aims to create a world where all people, regardless of gender, uh, race, um, ethnicity, sexual orientation, skin color, body size, right? All of that. Um, they still have access to safety. They still have access to joy. Um, and they're allowed to be fully expressed in this world. So my flavor of feminism is working towards a future where all of us can thrive. Mm -hmm. And then to bring that into my business, the, really the, the mission is to look at how business contributes to the types of oppression that people experience across humanity um, and how we as business owners can use our platforms uh, to create more room for joy, for pleasure, for safety, for freedom, for thriving. Yeah. Um, and that really includes everything from the way that I market my business, the systems that I use, the technology that I invest in to run my back end, the back end of my business, um, the way that I talk about my clients. And uh, it really like sort of bleeds into all aspects. And I like want to be straight up. I'm still learning what it means, right? We all live in a hyper-capitalist patriarchal system. And so we've all been conditioned and it's an ongoing process to decondition from those yeah, from those systems. And so the way that I mentor people is by my own experience and like what I have had to do to get free from like capitalist hyper productivity and uh, perfectionism and, you know, a lot of my own body stuff about living in a culture that says you're supposed to work, live and work a certain or live a certain way and look a certain way. Um, so I, I do a lot of looking at my own experiences. I've worked with clients now for like six years. And so I have a lot of like anecdotal evidence that I can draw on there. Um, and yeah, a lot of learning from people who don't necessarily look like me or hold the same identities. Um, and then helping my clients show up in a way that actually feels good for them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Through that feminist lens of how can we create more freedom and more pleasure for everyone who is involved. I know this is kind of a, um, a big question, so I, I apologize that it's not kind of um, uh, really specific, but can you give a couple examples maybe um, that might come to mind and, and how you get people to start approaching their business or their, you know, business life situation in a more feministic way? Like, what are some mm -hmm. of the things that you kind of bring up when you have those conversations with your clients? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So most of the people who come to me to work with me already have a sense that like things don't feel good. Mm -hmm. Things aren't working. And most of the people who come to me, like when I put feminist in my bio, um, it's a pretty large filter, um, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so I would say that most of the people who come to me are like already um, aware that mm -hmm. patriarchy and capitalism and ableism and white supremacy and all of these systems, uh, are impacting them and their businesses and their audience. And so I would mm -hmm. say that mm -hmm. that's part of why like feminist is like such a powerful label for me because the people who come through already have a general idea. Um, but you know, one of the things that, I would say a lot of my clients experience is like a lot of, um, productivity, like obsession and so, like almost like a compulsion around productivity, yeah. um, perfectionism and self-doubt. Like those are the big three that I think my clients are struggling with. It's and like so, every female business owner ever. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say the only difference is that, um, my clients are, are already aware that there are systems in place that contribute to that. Right. Where yeah. I think yeah. a lot of us, the, the sort of insidiousness of capitalism and patriarchy and these other systems of oppression is that they're very invisible to us by design. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and, but once we can see them, like once we're aware, we can't unsee that. And yeah. so I would say that like most of my clients are coming to me because they're like, I see this thing. I I'm seeing the way it's impacting me. Um, and I just need help. Um, like starting to deprogram from it. Uh, and, yeah. So I didn't really give you like too many specific examples there, but That's I would say okay. that, yeah. I would say that like, um, my people come to me because they are seeing that things aren't working. They're recognizing that there are systems outside of themselves, uh, that are making it really hard for them. And they've tried a lot of other things that haven't worked. And so they're coming <laughs> to me to help them figure out a path that works for them, that feels good. Uh, and that allows them to do the work that they know they're here to do. Yeah. I love that. You know, I, this is kind of a sort of on topic, but it, it sparked a, a thought I had. So I had a conversation with someone the other day about the Kardashians and the, the person I was speaking to dismissed the Kardashians as in like, oh, those dumb girls doing their dumb TV show. And mm -hmm. I, I stopped them in the, their tracks and I had a pretty blunt conversation with them saying, these are women that have created multi-million, multi-billion dollar companies pretty much from scratch. They had a little bit of a name, but you know, they, they built out these huge companies They've had to deal with the onslaught of people saying things about their bodies and about how they look and how they dress and different entities in that sense. And they've had to deal with a lot more than, say, someone like Elon Musk or Bill Gates has had to deal with in the sense of their private life, right? And nobody's celebrating their successes as females that have built literally billion-dollar companies, Um from scratch really. And so it was an interesting, once I said that to the person, they were like, Oh, like I'd never, they'd never thought about it that way. And so I think, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just makes me think about those blind spots that we have because we've been ingrained in this patriarchal society about mm. how things are and how men are successful and women are items or, you know, that's a pretty generic thing term. Right. But like that, it was just a good example that I, they had experienced and had this conversation with. And so I think it, it's interesting because the person I was speaking to about it is one of the like kindest, most like sweet per people ever. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they don't try to hurt anybody kind of thing. And they yeah. still had this bias built into them. Mm, yeah. And that actually reminds me of um, a couple of things that one of my mentors, Kelly Deals, um, who is a feminist copywriter and a feminist marketing um, educator and coach, uh, she says two things that I think are very relevant to this, like this, like uh, conversation that we're having around the Kardashians or around our biases. The first is that we all we're all in the water, so we're all wet. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. she means by that is like we all live in the system. So this person that you were talking with. Uh, clearly, even though they are a kind, loving, generous person, it sounds like, yeah. um, they have these biases and they have been conditioned to judge certain people, um, based on the way that society says we're supposed to judge people. Exactly. And then yeah. on the mm -hmm. other side of this, right? Like, you are so right. I'm also someone who is quick to judge the Kardashians. I will <laughs> be totally honest. Um, <laughs> and I think that the... Like what I want to say here is that like, yes, the Kardashians are probably judged unfairly because they're women, because their bodies have been sexualized because of, right. There are many reasons why people are judging, um, the Kardashian, the women Kardashians. Um, and also I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that just because I am a woman doesn't mean that I can't also perpetuate the patriarchy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like, as just because I'm like, I, I am as a woman and you and any of the women who are listening to this, we are oppressed by the patriarchy. And also often unintentionally, we are upholding the values that patriarchy has taught us. And yes, this is like yeah. when we mm -hmm. internalize patriarchal 
uh, values, patriarchal norms. So like on one hand, yeah, I love what you're saying about the Kardashians, um, you know, being held to a different standard than perhaps some of these cis het white men who are multi-billionaires. And also they yeah. are still <laughs> contributing to a culture that dehumanizes and relies on unpaid labor and right. Like, and, and, and yeah. So like, I, I really appreciate that nuance. And I think that like, that's when we open up that can of nuance, there's so much there. Yeah. I I mean, I definitely agree with you that it's, it's, and right. Cause I definitely (laughs) see the other side of like, you know, they're, they're also causing or, you know, keeping to the keeping to the norm of sexualizing women and you know there's a lot of conversation about labor and those kind of things too so i definitely hear the and but there is also they haven't been credited for what they have done because they are female right and so i agree with you there's so much nuance through it and it becomes a very large pandora's box that in the sense once you get into that conversation um but it's a but I think it's an eye-opening spot to at least bring light to where these situations are happening and how to have mm. those kind of conversations. Totally. And one of the other things that I just want to name here, because I said there was two things that my mentor Kelly Deals talks about. The other one is that in these situations, it can be really helpful to name patterns and not people. Yes. Because mm-hmm. by naming the Kardashians, we are like bringing in all of our preconceived notions, right? And like, obviously, it sounds like in the conversation that you had, like, it was already about the Kardashians. And so we saw Kardashian like, commercial, like it was totally, yeah, totally. <laughs> but like, yeah. I could, I could create some content around that. And I could post that online. And instead of saying like the Kardashians, I could say like, I could just have the conversation about women and men. Right. And I can just pull back a little bit and that sort of reduces the charge and like lets people come to these conversations with slightly less bias, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Definitely. Definitely. So we, you know, we've kind of delved into this, this really fascinating conversation that I would love to talk to you more about, but I think we, you know, prior to coming into the interview, we had talked a little bit about some of the areas that we want to talk about today. So I wanted to Mm -hmm. jump back into that a little bit and just kind of get your, your thoughts on some of these areas. And one of the areas we talked about was, um, uh, what businesses, like what they can do and how they play a role in toxins in our environment. I know part mm-hmm. of the things that you are um, into as much as I am is the climate change and kind of what's happening to the planet in that sense. Um, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on how as a business owner or someone who helps run a business, how can we think about our approach to the environment um, and, and our thought processes there? Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think for myself, um, I don't have a product, uh, product-based business. And so mm-hmm. when I'm thinking about sustainability, I'm thinking about it really in like, what are the companies that I am investing in? Yeah. Um, right. Like, so an example that comes up for me is like Google. I use a lot of Google systems and while Google is not a perfect company, um, they do have like really stringent goals and like really, uh, clear objectives around reducing carbon emissions. And so for those of us who, whether we are a consumer or a business owner, I think we have this opportunity to look at the places where we're spending our money and where we are investing our capital um, mm-hmm. and and really being discerning with that, right? Like another thing that I think is really important is like, okay, if I am like deciding between these three companies for um, my CRM, like can I look into the history of the company and maybe one of them is yeah, donating or reinvesting in communities that have been impacted by colonization. Or maybe there's a company that like operates fully on solar or something like that, right? There's a way that we can look into the places that we are investing our money and be discerning about how we support companies, right? And I wanna just acknowledge for like the average consumer, um, that can be like a daunting step, right? Like if it's like the in the town, the only option is shopping at Target or Walmart, like 
sometimes if we don't have that option. Yeah. Um, but I think that like when we can, when it is, um, when it makes sense for us to do that, I think it's really important. Um, and I also just like want to say here that like, I hate the idea that it is the consumer's responsibility to save the planet. Yes. <laughs> um, I am like, I'm not about putting the responsibility on individual families and people to like save the planet. Like, come on, corporations can do that work. Um, but I think that one way that we can push corporations to do that work is by choosing to withhold our support because of the way that they are operating. I totally, totally agree. I, I actually have a sign on my wall that always reminds me that says top down and bottom up and top down is the corporations, right? Like the corporations who played a huge role in getting us into the situation we're in now also need to play a huge role in getting us out of this situation, mm. right? And finding more sustainable business practices and moving us to a healthier um, future, right? But the mm. other side, top up, or I'm sorry, bottom up is going to be the grassroots. It's going to be the consumers. We too, as consumers, also need to take responsibility in how much we're consuming, what kind of items we're consuming. And you are absolutely correct. I don't think it should be all on the consumer. And I think that's actually something that the um, kind of business, the the business world has put on us. It's, it's a marketing ploy that they've put on us, right? That it's our responsibility to like recycle and reuse. And, and um, the reality is, is yes, it is on us to an extent because we also need to change some of our buying habits and our mm -hmm. expectations, but the real change is going to happen somewhere in the middle between the manufacturers changing and the grassroots consumer, um, changing as well. And, and, um, I think once we get to that point, we'll start to see real change. And I think from my perspective, we're right on the cusp of that. We're kind of coming up. You've seen a lot of movement in the last couple of years, especially around how um, vocal people have gotten about climate change. But I, I don't think we're there yet. We haven't pushed the manufacturers to the point where they really need to start making changes. And hopefully mo we move there faster <laughs> than slower. Yeah, but, yeah, seriously. Know, <laughs> tight on time here. But yeah, mm. I definitely agree with you in that sense. Um, what do you think, you know, you also talk about, um, radical courage and, and I, I love that terminology. How can we really start to identify radical courage in ourselves? Like, I guess, can you define that first? And then once we define that, how can we start to use that to change these issues or, or really make an impact for all of us, um, especially around environmental health? Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, so I think to define it, I just want to share like the Latin root of the word radical is root. And so when I'm talking about courageous, cur uh, when I'm talking about radical courage, rather, um, what I'm talking about is being courageous enough to look at the very roots of harm in our lives, right? I think there is a difference between being brave and like facing our fears and like being courageous and actually facing and standing up to and dismantling the systems and the cultural programming that is just dominant in the system that we live in. So when I'm talking about radical courage with my clients, I'm talking about, yes, inviting them to look at their fears and uh, to notice where they can make changes, but also to be someone who is willing to, yeah, almost like, I don't want to say like give up some of their own privilege or their own freedom, but like, yeah, in a sense, someone who is willing to take a risk to stand up for someone else, someone who is willing to take a risk to like wave the red flag, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, someone who is willing to point out how the status quo and how the cultural norms um, are actually incredibly harmful. Uh, and I think, you know, there has been a lot of conversation around, um, you know, speaking out against racism, speaking out against harm when we see it. And I just want to acknowledge that it's really hard. It's very hard to, you know, 
tell your racist uncle that what he's saying is not okay. It's very hard to uh, raise your hand in a class and tell, you know, let your teacher or your professor know that like what they said is not okay. Um, that takes a lot of courage. And so the work that I'm doing with my clients is like cultivating a sense of resilience and trusting that like, even if we are, even if we make a mistake in our um, attempts to be advocates, even if we have a misstep and actually cause harm ourselves, um, that we can apologize, that we can clean up that mess and that we can keep coming back to our mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, as business owners, we have to do that because like, we are like constantly dealing with new things in our business. But I think anyone can cultivate a sense of courage to work towards a world that is different than the one that we live in, right? Like that's yeah. really what courage and desire and all of these things is about challenging what exists and reaching for moving towards the things that we want, the things that we need to feel safe and to like have joy in our lives. Absolutely. I think, it, you know, maybe I'll use myself as an example, but I think it could work for so many different people. So the th thing that I'm really passionate about, obviously, is environmental toxins, right? There's these chemicals that are in these personal care products and beauty products and food we eat and the water we're exposed to and all these different things, right? And these toxins are negatively impacting our body. They're affecting our hormones. They're affecting our microbiome. They're, uh, you know, causing countless health issues. And so one of the things that I'm really trying to do is bring this to the forefront and talk to people about it, make change, and to educate the consumer, the average consumer, about how these different products that they're exposed to every day are impacting us, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the thing that I'm passionate about, but I think, you know, the, the listener has their own specific thing that they're passionate about. Maybe that's racism, or maybe that is... Um, you know, making some kind of change for local moms getting support that they need when they leave the hospitals or postpartum care or mental health support, whatever it is, whatever the thing that is that they're passionate about. How do we, how do we use, how do we find that radical courage within us to then mm -hmm. um, advocate for that change that we want to see in the world? Does, mm -hmm. it, does that make mm -hmm. sense as a question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when we're asking this question of like, how do we do this hard thing? Um, yeah. How do we like keep coming back when like, you know, the dominant system is what it is, right? Like it's all around us. And so for those of us who are challenging those norms, part of the courage piece is like the commitment to like keep coming back. Every time we get knocked down, every time we get told no, every time we, um, you know, someone tries to invalidate us or reject us, right? There's this like need for resilience. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just want to say like, that's not something that happens overnight, right? That's not just a decision. Like I decide that like, no matter what, I'm going to keep coming back. Um, well, the decision is part of it, but I think what we really want to, what I really want to suggest that people focus on is like, how can I show up just 1% more for my mission? How can I show up just 1% more for uh, my goals or my desires or my dreams? Because I think we, we um, again, right, like capitalism and patriarchy, like we think that there's like a perfect way to show up. And we right. think that like, mm -hmm. and there's this, uh, I was actually just on a call right before this and we were talking about the quote, anything that's worth doing is worth doing well. Um, and the coach actually reframed it for us and said, anything that's worth doing is worth doing poorly. Um, and that, mm. that, uh, that quote is, uh, Lee Cordell is the coach who just shared it with me. I don't think it was originally her quote, but right. So like, it's this courage and this, uh, willingness to like do things imperfectly, right? Like I imagine like at this point, you're like probably pretty well versed in like environmental toxins and like how those toxins show up in our lives. But I imagine you go back, like, I don't know how long you've been doing this work, but you know, you go back a few years and you probably didn't know as much as you know now. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. like your commitment to this was like a willingness to get it wrong, a willingness to learn, a willingness to um, change your mind. 
Absolutely. And, yeah. and I think that like, that's really the key, like this underlying piece around radical courage is a willingness to, um, yeah, to be imperfect mm -hmm. and like to trust ourselves that like we can, that like, it's okay to be imperfect. And if someone is unwilling to accept us in our imperfections, then like, maybe that's not our people. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, for folks who are asking themselves, like, or for folks who are saying, like, I have this mission, I really care about this thing, but like, I'm scared or it's hard or what if I screw up? Um, then the, my like advice or my suggestion is like, okay, well, let's start with 1%. How can we expand just a little bit beyond what we're doing right now? And can you give yourself permission to do it imperfectly? Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that, I think figuring out how to get over the perfection portion, it's like the most powerful tool that you have, because mm -hmm. I, I know for me, once I gave up perfectionism, it was just a matter of just move forward, just keep going. Like yeah. every day, just keep going, right? It's that 1% thing. And every day I'm getting closer and closer to like this grand idea that I have in my head. But what I realized while doing that was it's really just about the journey because the grand idea tweaks itself and changes slightly every day, right? So there's no real like end point in sight. There's some key milestones but there isn't like a, this is the finish line kind of thing. Mm. Whereas when I was looking at perfectionism and trying to get everything right, I would get so caught up in these mundane things that held me back from even the journey, let alone like the milestones mm. or whatever the end stone would be. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Perfectionism is such a trap because yeah. it's like about doing things perfectly, but actually it's about doing nothing because if we do nothing, nothing exactly. if we do nothing, yeah. then like we can't get anything wrong. And it's right. like, that is the, that's what got us into this mess. Like doing nothing because we were afraid of doing it. And again, this is not to shame anyone. Um, but like, this is how we got into this mess was like, mm -hmm. oh, I, as an individual, I can't make an impact. So like, I might as well not try. And like, that is a part of our cultural programming that is like mm -hmm. so such bs and like i i just i really if if i could just if people could just hear one thing from me it's like give yourself permission to be imperfect yeah oh i i so agree too and and the, it irks me on the inside when they say like one person can't change the world because mm. one person is changing the world all the time, right? Like there's these massive ripple effects from the decisions mm. that we make every day where yes. you look at these people who have started these businesses that have completely changed how we function in the world. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it may, it may have ended up being a group of people that got that business where it was, but there was one person that originally had that idea that decided to act on it. Right. And mm -hmm. so you never know what that's going to be. And so I think, I think it's a real misnomer and it really hinders so many, like imagine where we would be if we were all empowered to do the thing that we're motivated for to change the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we all put in that, imagine where humanity would be at this point. Totally. And like, I think that, and I'm just like, my friends always joke that I always have an and also like, I'm always <laughs> trying to like bring in a little nuance, like for those people who are listening, who are like, oh, but like the responsibility of feeling like I have to be the one to change the world, um, can feel like a lot for people. And so yeah. like, yes, one person can be a catalyst for incredible change and you do not have to do it alone. Right. right. You can yeah. find your people. You can like gather up the, the folks in your community. You can connect. Thank goodness for the internet. Like we can connect with people who share our visions all over the world. And mm -hmm. so yes, one person can be a catalyst for global change. And also you do not have to do it alone. Like find your people and like use their energy and their passion to help you gain, gain momentum. Absolutely. I think about when you say that, um, I, I work with this, um, small nonprofit. They're a small orphanage in Cameroon, Africa, mm. and it's just, it's a one little, um, 
uh, orphanage. There's about 70 or 80 kids that live there and they mm -hmm. cycle through and stuff. And the gentleman that founded it, he founded it probably close to 30 years now. It's probably like 25 years or so. Um, it was originally just a little table. I mean, it was literally a little tiny wood table where he would put food out for the local orphan kids around. Mm -hmm. And then that grew into something bigger. It became a little hut where he was able to house five or six kids. And then the community banded together and they built an extra room onto it. So they were able to house more. It is now a full on orphanage and it's been that way. And, and I worked with them to fundraise last year and they fundraised enough to buy land for for a second location so they can open up a second orphanage. And this is just a small grassroots orphanage in the middle of nowhere in Africa, right? But it was started by one man and he's mm. now changed the lives of all these orphans. And these orphans are going on to become, um, one's an optician, so he, or ophthalmologist. So he's, you know, helping people see there's not a whole lot of, uh, you know, ophthalmologists in Africa. So he's working with people to be able to get glasses and be able to see there's a mm. bunch of them that have gone on to be teachers and architects build, you know, help working on building their community to be, um, more, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but to provide more resources to the community. There's so many kids that have come out of this one thing and it just started with a table with some food. Right. Mm. And so it really, it's, it's really just, taking those little baby steps, that 1% at a time kind of thing. So, mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think there is, we definitely can be such powerful catalysts. And I think often we don't realize. Yeah, absolutely. Like we don't realize how like these little actions can create really massive ripples. Absolutely. So what, what inspires you the most to keep optimistic when it comes to like pushing your community towards change and, and to find their radical courage? Mm, that's a really great question. Um, and you know, I have like cited this now multiple times and have, I'm not, I can't remember where, like exactly who said this, but I, a few years ago, I was at a keynote um, a keynote speech and there were multiple indigenous leaders, um, from like, uh, from Turtle Island or the United States, um, talking about the next seven generations, um, which is a pretty common indigenous, uh, like proverb and like perspective is like healing seven, seven generations back and seven generations forward. Um, and unfortunately I cannot remember, and I will have to look this up because I've now cited it multiple times and <laughs> haven't been able to correctly cite <laughs> these people. But basically what they said is that the work that we are doing is not so that we can live in, you know, ultimate peace, ultimate, um, like it's not so that we can have it in our lives. It's so that we can move a little bit further forward so that we can pave the way a little bit more for the next generations. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I think about, you know, when I think back 20, 30, 60 years, I think about like the kinds of things that we worried about then are very different from the things that we are worried about now. And we've had lots of progress, but we've also pushed ourselves further and further into um, climate crisis and other, yeah, like really massive global issues that are impacting the entire world. And so like, it's kind of macabre and kind of a little bit morbid, but like what keeps me inspired is knowing that like, there are generations that will come after me that will continue to do the work. And it's like a little bit of a relief for me that I don't have to solve the, me and my generation, we don't have to solve it. We just need to get us far enough along and move further, like further towards our goals so that the next generation can then do their part. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it, it seems kind of morbid, but like my, my, my inspiration really comes from knowing that I just have to do my part. And that like, kind of, I love that though. It's kind of freeing in a sense, yet still inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I think that if each of us just recognizes that we have a small part to play and like, maybe that small part is just laying a few pavers for the kids ahead for the, you know, the kids and the people who are coming after us. Um, if that, 
if that small part is just healing our own generational trauma so that we don't pass it down to our children or we do our best not to pass it down to our children. Um, You know, whatever our small part is, if we can just focus on that, um, it feels like less pressure. It feels much more realistic. um, And it frees us up, I think, then to also be remembering that we are not meant to like sacrifice all of our joy and our freedom and our pleasure in the name of a movement, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think that like w- our work is only supposed to be a certain part of our, our lives, right? And that like yeah. the joy and all of the things that feel good are what allow us to keep showing up to that. Absolutely. I think about, you know, in the, in the environmental health world, one of the terms that we use a lot is the multi-generational effect. And so understanding that the chemicals that mom's exposed to will impact her baby, the fetus, but it also impacts her grandchild, the, the mm-hmm. baby of that child, right? And it's because of how our reproductive system is affected by these hormones when when we're in year to row. But when I think about the work I'm doing, the face, you know, everyone always says, have your avatar kind of thing in marketing, right? Who's your person? But for me, it's kind of this faceless object, but it's two generations removed. So it's, Mm. it's either my grandchild or my great grandchild, right? So Mm -hmm. something that doesn't even exist yet, but I Mm -hmm. have that image in my face or in my head. And that's who I'm working towards. That's who mm. I'm working towards moving this movement further so that when they are growing or when they are in utero, they are not impacted by these same chemicals. They have a healthier foundation to build off of from, from the get go. Um, and so I think about, you know, how do we, it's like that seven generation thing that you mentioned a moment ago. It's how do I make it a little bit better for the next couple of generations forward? Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I think that like, that's, that's what kind of keeps me going is knowing that I'm not alone in this. And sometimes it feels really lonely, right? Sometimes it feels like really lonely. Really lonely. (laughs) Um, And also I would be willing to bet that with a Google search, you can find someone who has a dream like yours and who is also doing their own version of this work. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I love that vision of like a little being who, yeah, hasn't even been thought of yet, right? right like right, your yeah, kids' right. kids' is kids, like there yeah. is no conception of this person. And also you're already holding space for them. Like that's a really oh, yeah. powerful Absolutely. Like, and very sweet, like, and I mean, I don't mean sweet in like a, yeah, like I'm not yeah. trying to be like, no, I know what you mean, but I mean like just a very <laughs> sweet vision. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I have some quick fire questions, but before I get to, I have have one last question that I I would really love to know from you. So in your wildest, you know, social change dream, like if that came true, Mm -hmm. what would that look like? What kind of hope are you, Mm. or what kind of change are you really hoping for? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So like in like the most like wildest, but most basic way, yeah. <laughs> um, it would be like a uh, four hour work days, four day work week for everybody. Um, because Love there that. are, en- there are enough of us. We have enough technology. There is enough yeah. that like, we do not need to be working 40 plus hours a week. Um, Absolutely. but like everything that ripples out from that is like more self-expression, um, a a complete deconstruction of the binary. Um, so that is like on the gender binary, on the like good, bad binary, um, and, and really, really letting people be who they are. Right. So many of us, don't get to be who we are because like we have to worry about getting a job or our job doesn't let us get tattoos or um you know if we show up a certain way online then like we could lose our jobs and like i'm all for people you know bucking the system and like not caring about what people think and also like financial security is a real thing in the system Mm -hmm. and so i think that like my vision like if like the most like if I could snap my fingers and like change the world, it would be a world where we have s- way more space to be who we are. Yeah. And like, Man, don't I have love to that. F- yeah. Yeah. And like, I just think about all of the people who are not allowed 
to be them full self, be their full selves for many reasons, right? There are Mm -hmm. lots of reasons. And like, depending on our identities, there are different layers of oppression. Um, And like, I think about the diversity of opinions and the diversity of perspectives and the diversity of creativity that is being squashed by this idea that we have to be able to perform in a capitalist corporate world is just pretty gross to me. (laughs) So I'm like, let's do away (laughs) with that. And like, let's see people. Let's really, really see people. Absolutely. I love that. It's so powerful. I'm so grateful for, for you just sharing your thoughts with us and, and all of this and just making space for this kind of conversation, I think is really, really powerful too. So I I commend you for the work that you're doing and for the support you're providing to your clients and just bringing this to the forefront. I think it's really powerful. So I I commend Mm -hmm. you again for the work you're doing. Thank Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Are you ready for some quick fire questions? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay, perfect. Um, what is your favorite or most impactful book, podcast, or documentary, and why? Okay, so that is like a lazy Susan changing. <laughs> thing. Yeah, my too, um, but yeah. So I would say my favorite podcast right now is Joyful Marketing from Simone Soul. Uh, she is brilliant, like literally brilliant. And her podcast has, she like warns people like hanging out with me is going to make you obsessed with marketing. And I feel (laughs) that she has stayed true to her promise in that. Um, and I would say like, even if you aren't a marketer, there's like value in that podcast. Um, but it's a really, really good one. And then my, I remember that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, definitely look it up. Uh, and then I would also like to add a book Um, I don't know that it's my favorite, but it is, it has been like sort of helpful for me in framing my position in the patriarchy. Um, and the book is called, uh, the patriarchy stress disorder by Valerie rain. Um, I do want to say that there is some like diet talk and like talk about weight loss in the book, which I don't love. Um, and it's a very interesting perspective about the way living in an oppressive culture actually traumatizes our brains. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very interesting to just, yeah, sort of recognize that like, it's not just like an inconvenience, right? It's actually changing our brain function. Um, and she does, she definitely offers some practices to help us get free from it. Very cool. I will be checking out both and I will link to both in the show notes just to awesome. make it easy to find for the listeners too. So, um, so you, you kind of touched on this a little bit throughout the podcast, but do you have, um, a, what is your best toxin free or eco-friendly living tip? If you have one, Ooh, that's a good one. Um, Hmm. So I would say that this is like maybe like a pretty basic one. Um, uh, but I think that like, drinking water and having access to water is like so important, like on a global scale, but also just for like my function. Um, (laughs) and this is a tip that actually recently came to me. I like have ADHD. And so like things that have multiple steps, my brain makes them even more complicated. And so find a reusable water vessel that works for you. Um, and so like for me, like having to take the lid off my water bottle and lift it up was like too much work for my brain. And so (laughs) I just like got a BPA free plastic reusable water bottle with a straw and like, I am more hydrated. I'm not like finding myself like out in public and like having to buy a plastic water bottle that like might have been sitting in the sun for three months. Like, um, find a reusable water vessel that like works for you and that helps you stay hydrated because your brain will function so much better. (laughs) Absolutely. Water is just so key to that too. It really is just, um, it's a must, obviously. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what does conscious living mean to you? Um, yeah. So I think that conscious living for me is just about being aware of the way that I am thinking about myself, the way that I think about others, um, and really, challenging the sort of automatic thoughts and the automatic responses that I have, Mm -hmm. um, and making conscious, there we go, using the word in the definition, (laughs) but being (laughs) discerning about, and like really making a conscious effort to 
shift the way that I respond to the world and, and, and react to the world and actually taking a moment to like, is that my thought? Or is that something that I've been programmed to think, right? It's, it's really yeah. conscious living is about slowing down. Absolutely. And like yeah. giving ourselves the time and the space to process everything that's happening around us and to really focus on moving towards a life that is rooted in our values. So for me, it's mm -hmm. like, how can I be more free? How can I be more courageous? How can I have more pleasure? How can I be more kind? Right. Those mm -hmm. are my, those are my values. And so a conscious life is about noticing where I'm not embodying those and making the effort to move in that direction. Absolutely. That it, it's very similar to my thought about it too. Originally going into is slowing down and giving some space to each of the decisions we're making. You know, when I, when I first went into, it, I was thinking about the space about, you know, obviously like the products we're buying or, or how we're impacting the planet based on the decisions we're making the way we live. Right. But, but I absolutely agree with you. I think there's so much more to it in the sense of slowing down to think about how, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis impacts others, the decisions that we make for ourselves and how mm. they impact ourselves or our family, those kind of things too. So yeah. I love your answer. I think it's phenomenal. Mm. Thank yeah. you. So my last question for you, Lauren, where can listeners connect with you? How can they find you? Yeah. So I spend most of my time on Instagram. Um, I love that platform. So I'm always sharing content there and I would love for folks to like hop in my DMs and, and we can chat. Um, I also have a free community for feminist business owners, um, even like feminist curious. <laughs> so if you're like wondering like, what the heck is this all about? Um, you can just go to feministbusinessnetwork.com and that's a free community um, where, yeah, I offer support and tips and have conversations around what it means to be feminist in our businesses. Love it. Can it also work for, for people who are maybe not entrepreneurs, but leaders in business as well? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. And then of course, well, I, I guess I have my website too. I should just like shout that out. Like you can find me on my website at laurenelizabethcoaching.com. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I will link to everything in the show notes too, just to make it as easy as possible. So awesome. yeah. Thank you, Nika. Awesome. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for coming on, for spending the time with me today and to share all of your insight and knowledge with us and the listeners. I'm super grateful for it. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And yeah, this was a great conversation. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share with your audience. Absolutely. Thank you.